this is the Fort River School Building Committee. This is uh, Wednesday, March 13th. Uh, and we are meeting in the police station uh, community room, and this is being taped uh, by Amherst Media. I uh, will call us to order. And the first order of business is to approve minutes from previous meetings. Um, I have stacked next to me meeting the meeting minutes from our first community event, which I thought I had corrected everything on, and then uh, the the regular meeting right after that, which would be the, the 19th of February. Um, uh, but I do not have meeting minutes ready for the subject. So if folks want to take copies or if they have comments, I have another copy. Is that another copy? Uh, I guess it is. Yeah, it is. I think you both were. I have already found it. I have this other file for you. I have that right. Yeah, a lot of people have that already. Yeah. Oh, that's this one. Um, so I do know that for the community event, I've got to, uh, to, to note that Diane did not make the community event, the first community event. But I'm hoping we can approve it with that error and then when we post for the corrective copy. Um, but if there are other things to know. Just uh, uh, sorry. quickly, um, uh, we should just note who is the minute taker. For yeah, oh, for, for each of them. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. I can add that. Trying to figure out if I was indeed at the February 19th meeting. It's all sounding very familiar to me, but I. Uh... The 19th was the forum, right? 19th was the no. one after the forum. Oh, yeah. Did I leave you off? Because I thought I had gone back and looked at the video for that to confirm who was in which spot. But it's possible that. Not me. I'm not. I, it's too long now. I can't say whether I got it right or not. Yeah. But if you think you were there, I will add you in. I'm pretty sure that Heather was, was there. there. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Are you looking for a motion? I am. Let's take them separately? Or? Yes, let's take the older one first, which is the community event. I move to approve uh, the meeting, the minutes of February 13th, 2019. Second. All in favor? I move to approve the minutes of February 19th, 2019. Second. All in favor? As, as noted. As noted, as correct. Oh, yeah, yeah, as mentioned. Those two. Those two. And I will make those changes before I pass it on the final ones. Um, uh, so the next item is who will take tonight's minutes. Um, and I, I have two backlog ones I still need to do, so I would greatly love it if someone would step, people would step forward to take tonight's minutes. So I brought a um, PowerPoint presentation and uh, a printout from that presentation for your benefit. I'm going to review the items that are on your agenda, um, but not in the same order. That's all right. So um, I call your attention to our slide presentation. Uh, we're going to talk about the geotechnical recommendations more specifically and the impact on the project budget. Uh, we'll talk about the rare species identification. That's a work in progress, quite frankly. I have a chart that I will share with you about the MSP share and uh, some thoughts about where future expansion could go and how big should that expansion be. And then lastly, we'll touch upon indoor air quality, um, of which humidity is only one factor. So um, let's talk about site. So the geotechnical recommendations uh, are summarized in this chart. We have low bearing pressure um, on, according to the geotechnical report. 
and some concern about settlement. Uh, the ground improvement for new two-story structures, I think I reported previously, does not need piles, but we do need to do something with the soils. Uh, in the two-story scenario, we would need to bring in stone, uh, place it within the soil to create a larger balloon, if you will, of area that could support um, foundations that would be placed on top of that uh, stone. So the cost of that is roughly tall dollars per square foot of the building footprint. And if you recall, design option A is the entirely new building. There's more footprint there. So there is a cost impact on option A, as you can see in that chart, $624,000 approximately. And then in option B, which has a slightly smaller footprint, it would be less. Now, I confess after we talked to our cost estimator that these costs were not included in the previous estimate. So consequently, you'll see an update in the, in the options summary of costs, uh, which we'll get to in a little bit uh, later. Um, the sequence of construction, um, which was cited in the Geotechnical Work Report, is, is a, a little bit of a concern to make sure that the new construction does not compromise the existing building. That's a normal process. There's no additional cost associated with that. Uh, it's a, it's a, a technique that the general contractor or the CM would undertake to make sure that the, the loading is done in the proper sequence. Um, groundwater control. Um, I did point out previously the existing building does not have waterproofing underneath it. Uh, we would uh, do waterproofing as part of our slab on grade work. The premium on that would be about two to five dollars per square foot. Uh, and that's now reflected in the costs. Uh, surface water control, uh, it's normal for us to do perimeter drainage. That would be part of the new construction, so that would not be a premium. And the comment about thickening the paving on the sidewalks or paved areas to uh, reduce the frost heaving that could occur, or the impact that frost heaving could have on pavement, uh, is, is insignificant, less than a dollar a square foot over the site uh, where we have paved areas. So those would those would be the recommendations. There is some cost impact, but that's been reflected a little bit later in the presentation tonight. Um, would you mind talking again about um, the section of groundwater control and what the difference um, between what we can do with existing and what we can't do, or uh, what, what we would be recommended for new? So under like the renovation to provide waterproofing at slab on grade, what, what is that? And how, how does one implement waterproofing on an existing slab? Well, what we would do is core through the existing slab. And then we would inject uh, an epoxy-based waterproofing material or um, other kinds of material that would form into a gel. Um, and that would be the only method that we could do uh, without removing the entire slab. So that's what we would recommend be done. Uh, and then we would plug those cores that we take out in order to, to do that. There are contractors who specialize in that kind of work. And so the two to five dollars per square foot, that's for both um, what, for that coring process and for an upgrade in the vapor barrier at? For, well, for a new building, we, would, we wouldn't need to do that coring. Well, the, only the existing so, so, so that really is, is so the cost premium is only for the second the existing column, slab the existing slab that's correct slab. that's correct oh so the two dollar is not new construction cost and the five dollar is the renovation cost and that gives you a range no, that's correct this is just that's no. the range that's the range just for the renovation water that's right okay okay and so is that clear great um would that give any insulation value to reduce condensation issues, or would you still have that problem? Um, the because condensation. The renovation. The condensation. We what we would do is do other things with mechanical systems as well as perhaps the exterior walls to reduce the amount of infiltration. Make sure that the windows are tight. Um, what we want to do is make sure that we're ventilating, we're dehumidifying. 
Um, you have air conditioning in the, in the existing building. I'm not sure how effective it is through unit ventilators. I suspect that some of them are not working properly. So in a new building scenario, or in a renovation scenario, we would do a different kind of system. And that would, through that kind of air conditioning, dehumidify and reduce the humidity in the air. But in, under a new building scenario, you would recommend under slab insulation? I would. For, yeah, so, so, and a new mechanical system. So and we would expect the new building to perform better than the renovated building in this regard. Absolutely. In a renovation scenario, you would be spending more energy dehumidifying or air conditioning than you would in a new building because the under slab would be insulated. I guess I just want to make sure that I fully understand that line. So we've established that the 2 to $5 per square foot is for the renovation scenario, not the new building scenario. Right. And we don't know, is that, and that is not, is, has that been included in the pricing that was done? Um, it, it is now. It is now. So yes. that was an add-on. Okay. Correct. And so then the everything in the right column would, hasn't previously been reflected in the... It has not. Okay. 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 And then... In terms of what was the um, the slab, but when you did the initial cost pricing, the um, new construction slab, you priced that because you would have, you know, that's modern construction. That's so correct. Yes. That's, okay. that's conventional. Yes. That's, that's normal practice. Today. Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. A vapor, a vapor retarder is standard practice, but a waterproofing membrane would not standard practice, correct? Waterproofing, well, waterproofing in terms of, uh, waterproofing is not standard practice, you're right. Vapor barrier is pretty standard practice. Uh, and we think that with proper sub-base preparation, stone and gravel, insulation, and vapor barrier, that's pretty adequate these days for a new construction. So, but there is, I'm oh, sorry, <laughs> but there is a waterproofing membrane included in, in the current designs and the current pricing? I believe it is. Okay. Let me confirm that. Okay. okay. All right. Other questions? Next slide. And, and I guess there's yep, right one, one last comment about it. Is that, so if the waterproofing membrane is included um, and, and it's determined that we should go forward you know, we would go forward if we were building in here. I think it would be interesting to see what that cost premium is, just because of the question that we're asking about, like what are the what are the cost premiums to build in this particular site? I think I'd be interested to hear that or see that. Let, let, let me conf confirm that. Okay, yeah, thanks. I want to be absolutely clear about that. So let me go back and reconfirm that. Heather, thanks. Um, I don't know if it's still coming up, but I guess from the you know from our understanding and for the public's understanding. You know, what is it about this site that that you would recommend upgrading from typical just vapor retarder construction to a full waterproofing membrane? Um, that's. Can you describe what was to, in the report that would cause you to make these levels of upgrade recommendations for this building on this site? Well, there is a high water table, uh, and in one location, what was discovered was a. Um, water under pressure, which when they cored through, it immediately came up above the surface of the earth. So because of that high water table, we would, we would do waterproofing underneath the slab. And I just need to confirm whether that's included in the updated cost. Um, normally, we would do just vapor barrier, and we would do insulation, as well as the subgrade preparation gravel. So that, that would be normal. But in this case, I think we would go the extra distance and actually make sure that there's waterproofing underneath the slab. And the, the critical difference there being that the vapor barrier is not going to stop bulk water from moving if right. you've got actual water that's, that's putting pressure against a, a building surface, then you need to, that step up. That's correct. I mean, it's, you might as well do it that way in new construction be absolutely certain, so there's no question later. So that's what I would recommend. 
in the new construction today on this particular site. Can I just remind us, I mean, we don't know the exact parameters, but there are some advantages to this site that you have a, a basically a flat site, and I don't think we found, found ledge there, right? No. So, and I, I can tell from other projects I've been involved on, those s slopes and ledge can add significant site costs that we don't have. So we have to remember that, yeah, we're getting some issues here, but we're not getting some other issues. It's hard to hurt those I would I um, I agree with that, but I, I and actually I would I would add that although uh, I think a, a, a really well done explanation that sort of walks. I mean, hopefully, it's a, I think I said this last meeting when I think you weren't here, but Jesse was that I'm I'm hoping um, that in the narrative you end up walking people through the implications of the geotechnical. Um, and of the building itself, what you know about it, and then what you're recommending mm -hmm. as, as different steps. Because um, from what I can tell, there are a lot of people in town. I mean, everybody sort of, regardless of folk wisdom versus facts versus data, which I'm not going to bother getting into, if you, get, if you look over the last 40 years, there's plenty of anecdotal evidence that, that it's a it's a suboptimal building in terms of moisture control and that's like kind of a mild way of putting it and so since everybody essentially knows that then people including like myself when I was 11 playing in the backfields at Fort River it was it was at times marshy <laughs> and so these are common experiences everyone has of this site and so I think our ability to explain this and explain how with modern construction techniques and materials you can actually create a, even if there's a cost premium and what the cost premium is, right. that you can actually create a usable building that shouldn't have the same kind of problems that it previously has had, is actually going to be a real, it's going to be a nice thing for the town to know, but the only way they're going to know it is if it's actually explained, <laughs> you walk people through those different elements so they can look and be like, oh, I get it. That's my view. I agree. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. So let me give you an example of a building that we had to have a lot of controls over due to moisture or ensuring that there would be, wouldn't be any moisture. We did a project on Staten Island, and it was in a mucky area. In fact, we had to do piles on that site. Um, and the building was, was to contain historic artifacts in from buildings in that historic district. And I'm talking large artifacts. There are fireplaces, doors, lumber from old houses, as well as horse-drawn carriages, furniture, all kinds of stuff. And this was to be uh, a collection that was to be contained using museum-level humidity controls. Mm -hmm. So uh, we made sure that the building was as tight as possible, we used a, a vapor barrier that was that was truly a vapor barrier, not just a plastic sheet within the exterior walls. It was a metallic vapor barrier with a, with a very high rating that was really preventing any vapor from getting through. Uh, because And we, we couldn't have the humidity fluctuate more than, I think, 5% in the building. And we, we were able to achieve it, but it was making sure that the walls were tight, the floor slab was tight. Um, so it is doable using modern techniques. And I just, I think from what I'm sensing from the questions and the comments, I think that this group understands that it's doable mm -hmm. and that, um, you know, and that every site has its own things, but I just think it's an important thing to come out of this, like um, Eric was saying, that we have a good, solid story about, like, what, you know, what is the, what are the, um, the challenges with the site and how are we going to deal with them and what's the cost per year? Yeah. I would I would even argue that whether it's this particular example you're using of the museum ish storage area mm -hmm. or another example pulling out an example like that and giving it isn't a bad idea. Just because I mean I I'm I would agree with I'm giving honestly my personal opinion. I actually would agree with Rudy. I actually don't like the fact that there are people in town that have such strong opinions about the Fort River site that they, they would like to discount it as a, a future site for a school sort of out of hand, 
primarily because of its of its uh, the water moisture issues in the past. And I believe you that you can create that that you can actually create a usable, workable building there. But I know that most people in town won't. <laughs> Not most people. Enough people in town won't unless unless they can be walked through the logic and feasibility of it, and also understand what the cost is because there's a tra trade offs on everything. Right. Always trade offs. Absolutely. I think the other part of the story that I'm interested in hearing is, and for the public to understand is, you know, you, you have a lot of freedom to address these kind of things in new construction, and with how much confidence can we say that we can address them as well as we would like to? under a renovation scenario. There's always more risk in renovation. This, this, that's absolutely true. But, I mean, you do the best you can. What you can do is do some testing to reassure everybody that you've done a good job. Um, let, me, let me think about that a little bit. Let me think about how to address that. I mean, is anybody going to guarantee that it's absolutely vapor-proof or waterproof under an existing slab if you've done some mitigation of it using a coring technique? I don't know. I, I've never asked the contractor to absolutely guarantee that that's been done. But maybe there is. Although I mean, even if, if, if under the more likely scenario that they won't, yeah. I, think, I think kind of talking to Eric's point is it's at least worth walking people through what how far you can go yeah. and then what are the remaining risks and, yeah. and at least provide that level of information. Ready? Do they ever go back and do small corings after this injection to see if the coverage has been uh, all the way under the slab or if well you know, they'll, they'll do statistical sampling you know they'll do so, some sample cores and see if in fact what the average depth has been for that material that's been injected. The spread in the yeah. radius from the hall. So you could you could theoretically check the coverage of your membrane. Right. You could also um, your injected membrane. You could also you know before you occupy the building um, do some create a negative pressure in the building and see if there's any any moisture brought up because you're now allowing some some moisture to penetrate uh, and see if you can measure any difference, you know, over a given period of time. All right, let me let me talk to a testing lab and see if there is a, a way to test to reassure people that it's been adequately done. And then, you know, the, another thing you can do is you can do infrared scanning, uh, which can also detect moisture if there's a, if there's a, any kind of a if there's any kind of infrared difference between one area and another, you know that that one area is wetter than another area. So I think there are test techniques that you can do, but let me find out more to reassure people. Yeah. So this is a 20 page document that we're still on page four. Yeah, it was <laughs> my, my next question was are folks satisfied with the answers and questions on this one? If, if so, I would love us to move on to the next page. Okay, uh, the next page has to do with uh, rare species habitat in the river area. So we had our consultant Berkshire Design Group um, address this question to uh, Massachusetts Division of Fisheries and Wildlife, which controls who has this information and will be able to report back to us on what sorts of flora and fauna might be affected uh, in this region. And so what they did is prepare this request to uh, that department along with mapping information showing where this region is, um, showing the extent of it, showing the existing conditions and the proposed conditions. Uh, and so we'll have to wait for a response from the state. Is there a typical timeline? I mean, was one of those things trying to think about whether it actually is able to come out with a report or has to be something that gets... It may have to be in a, a 
appendix. appendix. Attached yeah, my experience is that there's a very specific timeline with this. But yes, that's what we kind of my guess put in, too. And then there's like a 21 day turnaround time. Yeah. So I would imagine like six weeks might be the time horizon. But we can certainly submit this as part of the report yeah. and say that this is still in process as of the date of the report. Uh, right. So my question is, do we have to? Is there any vote that we have to do to for funding, or is this this is provided by the state? I think it's something they have to provide if at request. But yeah. Yeah. Correct me correct. If wrong. I just want to make sure that we <coughs> get it done. If right. We need to. I think there was a either a twenty-five or fifty dollar fee. That's all to submit it. So it, it is it. Uh, I mean, it's not uh, an outline reimbursable, so we are, are you eating that cost then? Uh, I'm eating it so far. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I should say Berkshire is eating it. They would ask for us to reimburse them, so. Okay. And if they ask us, we'll reimburse them, but if not. I'd like to suggest that when you're working with Berkshire on this, that when they submit, that they call and follow up and make sure that the submittal was received because I had an issue once where the submittal was not received. Oh, okay. <laughs> what report was that? What what submittal was that? Yeah. Was, I, I don't need to, I don't oh need yeah, to know, no, it was another project, but it was this this exact request. Yeah. Okay. Was, yeah. Okay. Ask for sure to follow up. Okay. So presumably there will be more on that later than there is today. Yeah. Okay, the, these, on the next page, page six, <coughs> is, uh, an update on costs. As you can see, previously option A was SU 63 point something million, and it's now the 64 million. Uh, and all of these have been adjusted. Uh, sorry, it's just the nature of this to, as you find more information, having to update the Yeah. Okay. So, Moving on to page eight, you'll see um, a score sheet for various incentive points that MSBA offers. So on the left-hand side, you see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven uh, items that they give you some additional incentive, some additional points for reimbursement. The first is maintenance, and that score, 1.3, is our estimate. You won't get that until you actually go through an MSBA process. Um, but I will tell you that um, previously you went through the MSBA process for Wildwood, and that was the score that you got. And it's very close to the score that we got on the West Springfield project that is going through MSBA process. In West Springfield, it was 1.31. Um, so we think that that's a reasonable estimate since. This is based upon the district's maintenance policies. And um, I don't think it's going to be different from what your experience was previously at Wildwood. So that's why we carry that number. You'll probably get that all the way, all the way across, regardless of which option you select. Yes? Um, uh, I'm just going to suggest that it, it's, it's not critical to what we're doing. I think putting this as a placeholder is fine. but. Because the district is now looking better, closer, deeper <laughs> at maintaining its buildings, um, the maximum that you can get for that is 2%. So that is something to think about and perhaps to let um, Sean Mangano know, the finance guy, um, that investing in our buildings now can actually raise, possibly raise sure. our reimbursement here. Yeah, is there a checklist yeah. that we could provide the district? Yeah. I don't know. Okay. Um, I have not seen a checklist from MSBA. Um, so they just like decide. pull it out of the air. I don't know how they do that. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> it's a mystery. All right, all right. We don't have to. Is something they score when they come around and do their? Yes. Well, I don't even want to know what to call, but all right. review. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I I can um, I can will happily send you guys the the regs on this. I mean, it's 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 not they're not going to make any promises, but just so that. We know what it is. We could probably include it in our report, but I think it's important for the town and the district to be aware that there's opportunity here. Yep. And aside from doing the right thing, right? <laughs> Eric, I'd actually be really interested in knowing more of that. I mean, if you can send it along, that'd be great. I'll, I'm happy to also follow up with with Sean and yeah, I, I have given Mike this to him. Um, there, there is another maintenance 
uh, uh, opportunity here for another uh, one percentage point for doing a school facility maintenance trust where you essentially um, promise to do good maintenance in the future and the MSBA will they give you an additional point of uh, reimbursement. Um, it's literally putting money aside. Yeah, they they will match trust, funds and do right, stuff yeah. like that, right? So um, there are opportunities here that I think the district. I'd love to get there. Do I don't know if we'll get there, but I know that we're we've been trying to organize ourselves in a more systematic way yeah. around maintenance, uh, and I think we are. Yeah. And. Um, so if there's a way we could think about either organizing and improving that, or even just presenting it, yeah. <laughs> so that if we got 1.3 before, yeah. if we don't get two, we get 1.5 or seven, yeah. that would be that would be good news. You, but have, it's also you have the same challenge every school district yeah. has, which is costs and money. Yeah. yeah. But I think it's important to note that the, the story here is that the MSBA rewards, rewards. good behavior and rewards yeah. good maintenance. So we should. I just take, know we have a better. I just know we have a better story to tell now than we did even a year ago. So that's good. Yeah. So you see zeros here because mm -hmm. there uh, you are not a newly formed regional, or this project would not be part of a newly formed regional school district. Uh, it's not a model school program. Um, are, you, are you familiar with the, what that is? So um, I, am, I am vaguely, but I'm probably the only one. MSBA has, I'm not sure they still do it, but they've had in the past a model school program. So they had um, school plans in their files. Oh, yeah. And you could pick from those files and say, we want to use these drawings and plans to build a school. That's their model school program. So yeah. there, there was an incentive associated with that. I'm not sure how successful it's been. I know some, some districts have tried it. Um, but that's not the case here. I mean, you, you, you're, you're doing a custom design. It's not going to be an off-the-shelf design. The next line is interesting. Major reconstruction, renovation, and reuse. MSBA acknowledges that it's financially prudent to renovate. And so they give you more money if you renovate. So that's why option A has zero incentive for that. And those that um, use more renovation, as you can see, you can get greater incentive. Um, overlay zoning and overlay zoning uh, don't apply here. You, are not, you don't have an overlay zoning for housing uh, in, in your town, so that's not relevant. And energy efficiencies, we've reported previously that options A, B, C can go beyond the code requirements uh, it's more difficult than options D, E, F, so we're estimating that you would get a 2% incentive for that item for at least three of the options. Um, on, on these zoning bump ups, is that something that we could, first, they don't have to be in the zone, the project can be just in a town that has the zone, and can we adopt the zone between now and say when it actually goes into construct or when it gets funded for construction or is there some time limit like you before you this has to be in place before you even start the MSBA process I don't know I don't know the answer to that question and I don't know what the what the trade-off is for the town to have that overlay zone what the impact is I'd be surprised if the 40R40S that it didn't need to be within that zone. I mean, I, I, you know, you know what that it is. It's a smart growth yeah. over overlay transit right. overlay district. So they're they're good things. The the yeah. wording is that um, uh, approved project in a, in a community that has adopted an overlay zoning district district pursuant to the provisions of MGL C40R C40S. Um, so, uh, overlay zoning district provides for either 100 units or more of housing in one, two, or three family structures at 50 percent. It doesn't, at least this, this part of the regulation doesn't specify 
where it is in relation to the project it says in a community that has adopted so I don't I don't for know the who that's a question. Unit one or for the for for both units. for the, either of these hmm. um, so I mean I don't know who to send this information to in town but town planner yeah okay. yeah yeah absolutely yeah, so but I'm just saying it may be something we want to do for other reasons right. why not double up and get some so you know, you can you can, can ask send it to absolutely you. but um, for now, we're counting it at zero. Right. Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry, you're, you're kind of triggering some other conversations <laughs> that may happen elsewhere. Right. So, as you can see, the total estimate for um, incentive points is as shown below. The highest is for C. So, using those incentive points, we take the um, base rate for the district, which is 64 percent. We add those incentive points, come up with the rate for Fort River um, in order to then calculate the cost to hand as family. So we have um, some ranges in there because some things are not eligible for re reimbursement. But as you can see here, we have in the option C scenario, cost to Amherst is the lowest, anywhere from 19 to 24 million. Actually, the lowest is. Enough, but I'm not sure you want to pursue that. Questions? Okay, um, the next page is an excerpt from the um, MSBA worksheet that calculates the ineligible scope items. And we can send to the committee this, this worksheet and then that way you can have, you can work with it, play with it, but so that you can see the effects that uh, various things have. Um, well, what Jesse did is pulled out on the right-hand side some important factors for you, uh, one of which is that MSBA has a site cost cap. They say you can't spend more than, I think it's 8% of your total project on site work. So if you have an unusual site, rock, for example, and you're spending a lot of money for a rock removal, they, they have a cap. And so Jesse's estimate is that 2.781 million would not be eligible because you have a fair amount of site work that you're exceeding that 8% cap. When you say not eligible, you mean anything above the 8% cap or none of that line item? Anything above the 8% yeah, okay. cap. Okay. They pay, in another way, is they pay up to that point, and then that's yes. it. it's on you. Yeah, that's I correct. just wanted to make sure it wasn't like it disqualified you. <laughs> right, yeah, hopefully we haven't done something yeah. like that. Okay. <laughs> no. no. So the next item, construction cost cap. MSB 8 also has a <coughs> cost cap, uh, which if you go to the next page, we try to explain. You see there are two graph lines there. One is the red line, which <coughs> is an indication of the cost of actual escalation of construction costs. So if you look at what we are, in 2019, we were estimating the construction dollars, um, and you project that forward to when you're going to be building the building, it's three, I'm sorry, it's $534 per square foot. That's, that's in our estimate. It, again, if you look at the year 2019, MSBA's cap for construction is $348. And if you look at the MS cap, MSBA cap historically, you can see that they've made adjustments um, a little bit, uh, roughly 4.5% per year. And then, so we're using that 4.5% per year to project forward to when our project uh, will be built. So that we're estimating to be $397 a square foot which means if your cost is above that, you're not going to reimburse that. So if you go through the math, going back to the previous page, the amount that they're not going to reimburse is $12,780,878 because that's above their cap as of that date. Okay. And then we have another um, item in your local regs regarding the percent for art. I think it's 1%. I think it's half a percent. Half a percent, percent, that's right, half a percent for art. So we're not entirely sure how this is going to be played out. Um, 
I'm not sure how the regulation, I'm not sure if you've had experience with how that regulation is applied. I believe it's fairly new, and it probably hasn't been an application at this scale. Yeah. Um, my understanding, this is now several weeks old uh, from having read it, it, is that it would be on our portion. So that, that half percent is not calculated on the whole thing, but on what the town's obligation would be. Um, but I don't think there's too many outs after that one. To that whole amount. So, if you identify that as art that's being added to the project, it's unlikely that MSBA is going to reimburse that. That part isn't necessarily a given. It no. doesn't. My reading of the text seemed like that it may or may not actually be associated with the building. It could be, but some of that money could also be used to fund other art in other places in town. But like, either way, like poetry, exactly or theater or music, it, it, it is, art is very broadly defined in that. that you mean way. like it goes into a fund or something? I, that's my understanding. I'm, again, I'm not going to pretend to be, be, a, be a, a, an expert on this. Maybe Maria or someone else knows more. Yeah. I was just going to add that it's worth noting the AG. I, last I checked, the AG has still not approved this law. <laughs> um, yes, there so, were some language questions. I yes, guess. so I, it's not really, I don't think it's 100% clear. And, they, and the AG had issues about how we were, the town was planning on implementing it. So I, I, I don't know that it's clear that it's going to go in as designed either. So I think we should assume, though, that we're not going to reimburse. If right. you recall, our total project budget includes this in yeah. the estimate. So now what we're doing is pulling it out, and we're saying that's not going to help us for reimbursement. I thought that's that makes sense. sense. Really yeah. sure. So, oh, sorry, Mike, so my, I guess um, this could be what you're walking us through, but the previous page gave your estimate of what would be our reimbursement rate and the cost of the project, cost of the town. Um, does this reflect this information, or is it, or not? I believe it does. Okay. I believe it does. So let me just, again, confirm that, but I believe when Jesse went through it, he took that out. Okay. Other questions on, on the MSBA participation portion. Um, well, there's a couple of more. Sorry, lines. Oh, sorry. I was going too fast. So um, the next line has to do okay. with furniture cost cap. MSBA will not reimburse you for furniture for a pre-K, and they have a cap on how much they will uh, reimburse you. And again, the worksheet will tell you when you get it, but it, it's they will pay twelve hundred dollars per student. They will reimburse you twelve hundred dollars per student. Okay, so um, so you have, you have to take out the pre-K, uh, and you you can you can only use this number for the approved enrollment figure. So based upon your population projections and the enrollment that they approved, we used four hundred and fifteen as the estimated approved enrollment by MSBA. So once you do that math. Uh, and then you realize you're actually spending more money, this amount is what would be ineligible. So if we, if we needed for the zero energy purposes to put in a special kind of elevator or a special kind of uh, kitchen equipment that was super efficient, we're already maxed out in our our reimbursement, it looks like, from the MSBA for equipment. So there's not going to be much chance that that will be partially be reimbursed if we have to have special, you know, like a super um, efficient elevator. No, this furniture cost cap is strictly loose furniture. Tables, loose chairs, furniture. desks. What about those kitchen those kitchen and equipment? That we, we, that we would categorize that as part of the construction cost. Okay. They're all pipe connected. It's all. So it's just loose, anything that's movable, that's in this line, but something that's like a, a range or oven that's actually fitted in the wall, that's part of the construction. That's correct. That's the way we but, classify it. But, but we should know that, that we are over the construction cap, too. So in a sense, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, it's a different pile, but the, the same is still yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we hit it for just a different reason. reason. Okay. Right. We've hit, the, we've hit most of the walls, it looks like. Yeah. And the same thing for soft cap. They have, they have a soft cost cap, we have a 20% cap on all soft costs. And our estimate is that it says that it's going to be higher than that. Okay. Right. 
So um, all of these caps does beg the question of, you know, if they're capping it, you know, let's say for 2022 construction at 397 cost per square foot for construction. And we're coming out at 534. It kind of gets back to the question way back of like, what more are we getting for this? And I do know that, um, I think, I don't know if there's ever been an MSBA project that hit their cap, you know, where there was no ineligible expenses. Well, back before 2010. Way, way they, back if, when. You, <laughs> you, know, and, and, right, you, know. you know, which makes me say, I should call my, my state reps and say, you know, you guys got to correct for the, the inflation. Right. <laughs> you, you are correct. The MSBA has lagged behind, has not kept up with the rate of inflation. Wasn't that because there was an economic collapse? Well, there were. The there was. And, and, well, except that, that the, it looks like the state also took that, a, that opportunity to not increase. Oh, sure, 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 yeah, sure. sure. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah, the yeah, problem. Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, the other problem yeah. is that, I mean, the, the MSBA, I mean, we think of it as, like, always having existed, but it got right. it rebooted. I mean, that it was true. offline yeah. right. Right. until, you know, 2008, and there weren't any projects that were happening until 2009 right. and beyond. So that that really is all of the data for yeah. the MSBA. There is nothing before that. Okay. Um, but is there, I mean, uh, you always look at this and you say, okay, so we, we've gone beyond the cap. Is there anything we could, should think about in our project that would say, well, should we dial anything back, or are we pretty much? No. Okay. I think everyone is in this predicament. <coughs> everyone. So I would not try to try to get the MSDA again. You, you, you're going. You're going to. You're going to really handicap the, the project. I'm, this is this is just to, as way of yeah. explaining that. Yeah. Just because there's a cap, it's not that. That's not your goal. It's sort of. It's sort of. Um, I guess it must be analogous to everything else we have in school funding, where we just have massively insufficient state funding that doesn't recognize the true costs and is burdening <coughs> local towns too much. Whereas the original intent of how school funding was supposed to work in Massachusetts is that the state would equal the states. It doesn't quite work that way. Moving on. Okay. I, I have neglected to keep my slides current with the pages, so I have to fast forward a few pages. So now we're on page 13, the future expansion question. So what do you mean by future expansion? I suppose one way to do it is to assume that you have a building that has been built for 84,000 square feet, which is the program that we've been talking about. And now, future expansion. So if you go to a population of 600, what does that mean? You could leave the core as it is, keep the cafeteria as it is, the gym as it is, and just add classrooms. That might be one way to do it. Or what we chose to do is look at what a 600 pupil population, how MSBA would treat a 600 pupil population in terms of square footage. What would they need? to be the correct square footage. The same way we use MSBA as a test for the appropriate size of a 465 pupil school. If we use that method and use 600, MSBA's calculation comes out to 106,000 square feet. So that's the way we interpret it, expanding the population to 600. Start with 600, let's see what's published in our papers. And if that were the scenario, is there room to increase the size of the footprint in the options that we've presented? So the next several pages show site plans for each option. And if you look at the um, upper right corner of the footprint of the building, you'll see a faint orange footprint. Mm -hmm. That oh, faint okay. orange. Huge bus queue. Yeah. Yes. That faint orange footprint represents um, a future two-story, 22,000 square foot increase in footprint to get to the 600 pupil, 106,000 square feet. So you can do it in that corner for option A. In option B, you'll see another faint orange footprint, again, adjacent to the paved play area. Option C is the bigger footprint, 
but it does encroach upon that play field area. Oh, because it's also because it's single story. Right. And then in option D, we're doing it on the northern end of the building, <coughs> as you can see there. And then in option E, on the eastern side of the building. So that's how you would expand. Yeah, I guess when um, uh, this is presumably to meet one of the criteria that we set up in the beginning, to, which talked about looking at if, if, if this needed to grow at, at some point in the future. So when I was thinking about that, it was more in terms of not thinking turning a 420 or 465 into a 600 student school. But what if your enrollment grew such that you had to add a few classrooms? such as was done at Crocker Farm in 2002. And that's, that was more my interpretation of, if you, you know, taking the project that we yep. were starting with, if you needed to grow, how would you do that? What, you know, is there a way that would logically make sense with the floor plans with, that we've developed that we, you could put either a second story on some part or, or build out, rather than saying, okay, you're gonna need another 20,000 square feet to build a school of a different size. Sure. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So the difference between 465 and uh, 600 is 135. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So 135 times or divided by the maximum. What, what's your classroom guideline? Is it 20. 20. So divided by 20, so that's, say, seven classrooms. So seven classrooms, that probably will amount to about 10,000 square feet. So rather than building, uh, so that's what you would do. You would build a 10,000 square foot addition, just classrooms to accommodate that population. So, I mean, and you would do a similar thing. You would extend one wing of the building build some more classrooms if it's a two-story uh, option, you would build a two-story extension to the building if it's a one-story one extension. Right. And then maybe this was said already, but and then there's enough uh, room in the other facilities, gym, library, cafeteria, kitchen, and so forth to accommodate that, this, this addition of 135 students doing that or do we hit other problems then with or is that what the difference between this 10,000 uh, square feet and the 22,000 square feet that you have indicated here is that, that that's the way I was interpreting it. Yes. okay right because when you go through the MSB calculation they, they adjust everything right so this is this is somehow adjusting those other spaces to correctly uh, Without without spending the time to actually yeah, figure right. that out, which is okay. well beyond Thank you. what we can do. Yeah. So you're talking about building an addition of ten thousand to twenty two thousand square feet, roughly. Okay. And, and there's room to do that. Is the point? Can, can I ask another question? Yes. Here? This is more for us. Is am I being naive to think this is sort of thinking about if we go to a six hundred? student plan, uh, will this site conceptually fit it? If we're not, not future growth, but this becomes the site we're looking at for a 600 student school. I think that's a much more in-depth study that goes beyond uh, the scope of our work. I mean, I think what this can show is that there may be room for more building, but I don't think we want to ask them to start figuring out the site, the site components. I'm not asking them. No, is I don't. That I don't, sort of I don't in think in behind you. this question, or no, it wasn't, this is strictly wasn't my question, so I have no idea. I, I mean, I think in terms, uh, I think it's. I think it, I, I don't really care if this is in here or not. I think that I think the point from Rain Rain earlier is that under any circumstance, you'd want to ask the question: uh, if we build this, can we expand it? If we like, like, not forget any other conversations out there. Could you expand it if you needed to? And if you could. Where would it fit on the site conceptually? And does that, and just does it pass the smell test when you look at it, that says this looks like something that could be viable? 
So I think the fact, Rudy, that you're making that it conceptually could have implications as this being a viable site for a 600 person school, that's good, but I mean, it's not the point of asking. You just get the information and you can use it however you want. Right, so in answer to the question, one question is, is there room for expansion? The answer is yes. The other question that Rudy was getting to, which you're going to have to do anyway, if the decision, and I know that's by others, so this body's question, if the decision is, we got to look at a 600 people building located somewhere, I think you're going to have to look at Fort River as a potential site, as well as another site, as well as sites that haven't been identified yet, to determine what the optimal site is. I'm sure it would be, I'm sure it would, I mean, we probably should just move on because we're not going to answer any of this here, but yeah. I, I'm sure it will be, I mean, I'm sure it'll have to be, and besides that, I think it's a little bit like the water question that we asked earlier, or we discussed at the beginning of the meeting, where I'm happy if when we're, people are looking at the report and discussing this, they don't um, sort of a priori decide that we can't possibly conceivably look at Fort River and why would we ever bother? Right. Either A, because of water issues, or B, because well, where are you going to build? And if you could at least start from the point that, well, based on this analysis, you could expand this off of this concept and with various mitigations, you could deal with water. All right, then you have the conversation and you did the analysis. Right. Moving on. Right. Yep. Yep. Okay. So the last question pertains to indoor air quality. And I think it started about humidity, but we, we wanted to address in this report air quality, which includes uh, humidity. Um, and I think these are the things that would be important in the construction of the building, a new building or a significant renovation of the building. First is monitoring and control. I mean, these days you monitor everything. And, uh, and it, again, it's budget driven. What we have is a budget is a reasonable budget, but you can go crazy with monitoring. You can, you can monitor air pressure at every length of duct so you can tell whether the duct is dirty or whether the filters need to be uh, replaced. You can tell whether the pumps are working. You can tell whether you know, fans are working or whether they're, you're having a problem. So these days, unlike 1974 or whenever the building was built, there's very little controls, very little. Today, you can monitor controls, monitor your environment, you can watch trends, and it will be a great asset in uh, maintenance humidity control and air quality. Second item is provide ventilation, air conditioning, and dehumidification. So you don't have adequate ventilation in the existing building now. You would need to bring fresh air in, but at certain times of the year you're bringing in humid air. So you need to dehumidify that and you use that. You do that with air conditioning basically. Um, so that's something that would be done in a modern building today. You would eliminate pollutants. That's the next item. That goes toward air quality. Uh, you would put in high efficiency filters. Make sure that you're um, filtering the air that's coming in. And you know, there's background stuff out there. Uh, in the uh, There's mold out there. So you could be filtering all that stuff. The, the air quality within the building would be better than the air quality outside the building. Um, and of course, the selection of materials to ensure low emissions of VOCs, uh, make sure people aren't having allergic reactions to the materials that you've included in the building. That's what would be considered in a modern building today. Um, we would create a very tight building. I think this is mentioned in my example on Staten Island, you can't have any humidity migrating through the walls uh, at all. So you would have a true vapor barrier uh, on the exterior. And then you could also pressure test the building to make sure there's no leakage. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the last one, you could also call, don't do stupid engineering, but if you, if you create exhausts that are near intakes, that's stupid. 
or near chimneys or vents and so on. So you just make sure that in the design, and I've seen it happen, not in our projects, but um, you know, you just make sure that you're not creating your own problem by uh, re-entering into the building things that you've just exhausted. So that hopefully addresses the question about air quality in design. This is slightly off topic, but I believe the Atfall School's new school used a non-air conditioning system for part or all of the building, and it reduced energy use and was a cheaper system. I know that's not exactly the ventilation, but did we, this is probably going back before I was on the committee, did we look at that for all or part of the building, or we assume the entire building is air conditioned? I'm not sure I know what the system is that you're talking about, but we were talking about the whole building being air conditioned. Okay. What is the system that you're... I, I, Sorry, I'm forgetting the name. It's something like distributed air, but um, that's not right. Uh, and I happen to be watching another school building committee's uh, meetings, and they were debating this question. And uh, there's a lot of capital savings, and apparently, and operating savings by zoning the building and the parts that you aren't going to need brought down to a certain temperature and using this other system, which ha apparently involves moving more outside air through the building. Um, I believe the system you're referring to is called air displacement. That's it, air displacement. Uh, and it does move a lot of air. And the theory behind it is that you deliver the air low in the space, and then through um, the occupants in the building, it heats up, and then, it, and then through convection, it rises in the space, and then it exhausted that way, but the theory is that you could deliver lower temperature air because it's very close to you, rather than delivering it in a remote location and having it mix in with the air. So that's the theory behind it. It has been done. Uh, <coughs> it's becoming more prevalent. I don't think air displacement was one of the choices that we looked at. It and does require a lot of ductwork. And does that become part of your <coughs> air ventilation system in effect too, that you're using that system to <coughs> do some of these things? Or yes. is that yes. yes. You would you would not have another air system doing this. That would all be incorporated in the air displacement. In the air displacement system. system. Yeah. So as we get down the pipe where we're looking at construction and if we wanted to rethink or save money or think about temperature different temperature regimes in the school building based on usage, that might be something we could come back and look at. Yes, yes. Okay. And it's applicable, those kinds of systems are applicable to um, smaller spaces, classrooms, you know, uh, pupil support spaces, even admin areas. They're not applicable really to large spaces like gymnasiums or cafeterias. So yeah. you typically you'll end up with a hybrid you'll end up with the more conventional systems in those large spaces, air displacement in the smaller spaces. And, um, and one of the things you pointed out early on um, was ducted systems, while they have their advantages, are much easier to deal with in, in new construction correct. than in renovations. One of our cha challenges with this building that renovations is the lack of space for ducts. That's correct. Next item I have on our agenda is the independent cost estimate. Um, obviously, you have tweaked your estimates, um, right. and so as soon as that sort of uh, the document is ready, that talks about what a cost estimator, or I should say, ready, uh, is edited or updated, um, we would love to get a copy of that. So that you know, what that what other exercise? What. Jesse talked to me about that, and so what he did prepare is this uh, addendum okay. to our narrative. Okay. So uh, you could handle it this way as an addendum, rather than waiting for That's us fine. to to um, reissue the whole thing. If you're interested in issuing this soon, just take what we've written before and add this addendum. And I guess I need to confirm that we have the original one. I, I oh. can't recall if we do. Did, did Jesse? 
64 then too by each against uh, I don't think I nothing, nothing's been sent to me personally okay. at, at any point really unless I've oh. uh, specifically I don't think so right. just because we're talking about the pricing narrative yeah so yes. we had been issued that ages ago right. oh, okay um, so we do have that and if and if everything I haven't seen this addendum but if that accounts for all the changes that have happened from that from that first issuance till now, then uh, that would I, mean, I would okay. love to see that. But I think that would be all we need. We do. I I we can do, put we my do hands have, okay, good. Yeah, well, no, we definitely do have the original narrative. It's just that was like six weeks ago. Or something. Oh, longer, 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 yeah, longer than that. Yeah. yeah so I, my answer, my assumption was that it had significant revisions, but. Yeah. If it can all be handled in one thing. If it can be handled in an addendum, I'm not perfectly okay so with that. That's fine with me, yeah. But I actually prefer it that way because it's sort of the record keeping. It's that's true. The, the you can track kind the of changes. discussions that have happened yeah. over time, which is kind of a nice yeah. record of that. Mm -hmm. I don't okay. think it would kill us to get another, to get, to make, make sure, if, you, if Jessica could send it again. Sure. Just I'll make sure, sure that, that he sends app. it again, the current version of it, yeah. plus the identical. I mean, obviously, it could be identical to the one we already have, but it's just nice to know it yeah. really is here at the back. Okay. Right. So then, uh, just to clarify our, our we working group here, then we should check that over and just make sure, and then are we then all set? I, I had sent mm -hmm. some information. I responded to, to that, and I don't know if we want to talk about that. Right. Um, I mean, I think the only uh, remaining task for the working group would be to identify the options that we want. Because we talked about, we talked in the whole committee about we wanted to make sure each option had the same enrollment figures, and we probably need to pick an HVAC option for each, the most appropriate HVAC option for each. I, I, I think that's it as far as tasks for the working group. And we've delegated that for you to do. Yeah, for yes. the three of us. So, okay. Yeah, I think. I think we can, and then I'll, I'll immediately issue it. I'm not going to bring it back to the committee, I think, was the understanding, right? Not right. Immediately. And, and it's sure. important for the estimator, you know, the independent estimator, to have meeting for us. Mm. Because we didn't write plans and specs. Right. This is not like a bid scenario where you de identify the plans and specs on every detail for cost estimators, bidders to bid on. Yeah. This is a cost estimating effort. There needs to be a lot of dialogue between the design intention and the estimator to put in the appropriate numbers. So yeah, I think I think that was our intention. Okay. Right. So as long as the it's estimator a, is aware of that. Yeah, I mean it's kind of we we know it's kind of a weird animal and it's maybe if we were designing the whole feasibility process from the start we might have done this differently, but yeah. we have a mandate and, and it is good yeah. information to have. So, so. I, I, we understand it and we appreciate it. A cost estimator can give you a cost estimate without any information other than the size of building and where is it going. You right. can come up with a number. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but we <laughs> have a lot of information. Yeah. A lot of information needs to be conveyed verbally. So yeah. as long as he's aware of that. Sorry. So our agenda is... I, I think we've come to the end of our agenda. We have invoices. invoices. All invoices. invoices. So sorry. There are three. And uh, you'll have to have I emailed them in advance and there are copies of our Third one? Yeah. Uh, third, so there's a two-sided. Oh, it's on the two side. Oh, yeah, no paper. I, I do my best. Does anyone have any questions on the Okay. Um, there. Move the approval of TSKP Studio invoice number five. Second. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Figured you wanted to stick around. I'll repeat that task. Uh, I move the approval of Berkshire Design Group uh, invoice number 7.212018-110-1. I like yours. <laughs> Second. All in favor? Lastly, I move the approval of O'Reilly Talbot and Oaken Associates invoice number 47164. Second. Second. Oh, oh, I didn't talk to Gordon got there first. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. We should, I should probably put on the agenda next time, maybe a little bit of budget since we've 
just spent a little bit of money. Yep, I will have another spreadsheet ready for you. So, um, before we do the other thing, so just um, we do have this room on the 27th from 6 to 8 as for our usual time. Um, are we um, are we at getting uh, the draft? Yeah, we, um, that was on Jesse's schedule. Yeah, it's Perfect. on Jesse's schedule. We will get that to you before okay. that meeting, okay. obviously, so you can look at it before that. Is there anything else, I mean, aside from reviewing that, is there anything else you need from us? No. Okay. Great. Heather? One um, question that I was reminded about, looking at the, the numbers, about how the um, E option uh, for a smaller enrollment is um, very similar to the E option for a larger enrollment um, in the, the expected costs for that. And my assumption is that um, that's because there's no swing space available um, to move students around and so you have to pay for swing space, but yeah, without looking at those numbers off the top of your head, that's just sort of anomaly of the an option E like the the roll the numbers coming very close from the lower enrollment to the higher enrollment. I, let me look at that carefully. I'm, I'm not sure I remember. Um, but you're, what you're saying is that the costs are similar. Yeah, the, for like there's no, the there's no cost increased for an additional hundred and over you know, three fifty to four seventy five or four sixty five. Why is that? And my, you know, my guess would be that it, it's trying to include costs for housing students when they're displaced because under a normal, uh, renovation, when we are not in that particular scenario, we don't have an addition to move students into during renovation that is because true. we're making use of yeah. almost the entire existing building. That is so true. So where do we put the students? So I'm assuming, you know, the reason that's unique in that regard that the costs are very similar between those two enrollment figures is because that's the only option where we have like no addition space. Correct. I think that's the option that had temporary space. Yeah, that's the one that had required right. temporary space. And is that space. why the costs it, are so similar? It could be. That, yeah. I know that temporary space was included in that analysis, but let me, let me just confirm. Okay. Other comments, questions? Otherwise, I'll take a motion to adjourn. To adjourn? Second. All in favor?